Let us start the 27th session of Secrets of Spirituality. We had already discussed half of the 10 commandments in the last session. So today let me start with the 6th commandment that was revealed to Moses. Thou shalt not kill. This basically means you should not kill. It means the same words. Means you should not kill means you should not kill any such life form which is under pain or which is going to have pain. So it simply means the same sentence. It need not be interpreted in many different ways. Even at the time of Moses, he also told thou shalt not kill means thou shalt not kill even for the sake of food also. It has not told in any of the Ten Commandments that you can kill for the sake of food. Thou shalt not kill means thou shalt not kill. That's all. But then again, uh, some other logic may come that, sir, if a mosquito comes to bite, should I kill or not? Or if a snake comes to bite, should I kill or not? If a scorpion comes to bite, should I kill or not? Now that is where you apply logic. Because you will have to survive. If you have to survive, if something is causing you threat, then you should use your own power to survive. If let us say an enemy is coming to kill you, you cannot say that it, it in the Ten Commandments, Sixth Commandment says thou shalt not kill, so I will not kill. You should not say that. That is why in the Vedic system we have Brahma Dharma and Kshatra Dharma. Brahma Dharma is for following the righteousness or teaching the righteous path. But even the Brahma Dharma needs to be protected by the Kshatra Dharma. So we require courageous, brave people also to protect the others. That is why in the Indian system of administration, in the olden days, you could observe that every king had a spiritual teacher. Every king had a guru, but that guru was not a normal person. That guru himself was a self-realized master. Shivaji had Samartha Ramadasa. Samartha Ramadasa was a spiritual master, self-realized master. Hakka and Bukka, they had Vidyaranya. Vidyaranya belonged to the Acharya Parampara of Adi Shankara himself. So, even in the ancient scriptures, you will see that uh, all the kings had some spiritual masters as their teachers. That is how it used to be Brahma Dharma and Kshatra Dharma. Why I am telling all these things is that thou shalt not kill does not mean that you should not kill the enemies also or you should not kill the, uh, the uh, life forms which are causing threat to you also. So that is where a logic is required. But at the same time, wrong, wrong logic need not be connected to the same commandment saying we shall kill for the food also. That is where people have been using all the scriptural statements also for their own convenience. But regarding this I had told at length while discussing the uh, art and science of eating sessions. So let me not tell further, let me go to the seventh commandment. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Means you should be committed to your life partner or spouse. Let me tell you the story of Uddhalaka and Shvetaketu once again 
but with the different context. Last time I had told the story of Uddalak and Shwetaketu with respect to the test of knowledge. When son came back, the father tested whether the son has learned what he was supposed to learn. That was one side of the story. There is another story which is related to both of them. That is, when Shweta Ketu came back, he did not find his mother in the house. So Shweta Ketu asked Uddalaka, where is my mother? Uddalaka told that uh, your mother is not staying with me now. She is staying with another man. Now Shweta Ketu said, how is it possible? Then Uddalaka told, of course, this is what is being followed and we have been having such lifestyle only. Your mother did not uh, want to be with me further. She started liking some other man. Now she is staying with some other man. Again, Shweta Ketu told, I want my mother. Then Uddalaka told, of course, she was your mother. But she is no more my wife. As she decided not to stay with me, she is staying with somebody else. And she will not come back also because that other man will not allow her to come back now. Then Shweta Ketu told, this cannot be so. You people cannot live like animals. You are all human beings. Then Uddalaka told, yes, you think that way that we cannot live like animals, we should live like humans. That is your opinion. But this has been the system since many centuries, I don't know. This has been the system where any man who wants to uh, quit can quit. Any woman who wants to quit can quit. With whomever they want to live, they can live. That is how we have been having this system and it has been going on. Even my father was like that, even his father was like that, even my mother was like that, even my grandmother was like that. Here people have the freedom whether to stay with the particular person or to quit and start living with another person. Now Shweta Ketu again told, I have lost my mother. Then Uddalaka told, you think that you have lost your mother. But that way, this has been happening. We don't know since when this has been happening. It has been going on this way. Then Shweta Ketu told, we should find a solution for this. Just like I lost my mother, in future people should not lose their own fathers and mothers. Then Uddalaka told, in what way you are going to bring a change? Then Shweta Ketu told, I am going to bring a change now. From now on, I am going to make it mandatory that one man and woman, when they start living, they should promise each other that they will start living with each other lifelong and they should promise it in front of a sacred fire. And I will call this particular uh, ceremony or system as the system of marriage. It is one of the samskaras called Vivaha. So it was Shweta Ketu who included marriage or Vivaha as one of the samskaras in the total 16 samskaras. Now some of you may appreciate Shweta Ketu, some of you may curse Shweta Ketu also. <laughs> that is up to people. Some people think marriage is very much required. Some people also think marriage is a bondage. It is up to you. But if you consider marriage as a culture, then that is very much required that way. So it was Shweta Ketu who later on made it mandatory for the people that once they decide to live together, they should promise to each other or especially the man should promise to the woman that dharmecha, arthecha, kamecha, nati charami means in the righteousness, in the wealth, in the fulfillment of desires, 
I will never leave you. I will take you with me. That is the promise. Of course, Moksha Nati Charami that nobody can promise. Nobody can take somebody else along with them towards liberation or salvation. Because liberation or salvation or moksha is a personal effort by every individual. That is why in the Hindu system of marriage or so to say in the Vedic system of marriage, even now they promise dharmecha, arthecha, kamecha, nati charami. But do they understand that meaning of that mantra or not is again questionable. So before Shweta Ketu, people used to live freely with whomever they wanted to live. In fact, if you observe, even in the West nowadays or in other cultures nowadays, even the same method is being followed. If somebody wants to live with somebody, they will stay together for some time. If they want to quit each other's company, they will simply quit. They don't think it is something wrong. Because they think it is their decision, it is their freedom. But in effect, what is going to happen? In effect, what is going to happen is, how are the offspring or the children going to be nurtured? How are the children going to be educated? Or how are the children going to be cultured? That is a question. That is where Shweta Ketu had made it mandatory that when a man and a woman uh, want to live together, they should bind themselves in the system of marriage and this should happen in front of the elders. The ceremony should happen in front of the elders of both the families. That is how Vivaha became a samskara. But, of course, the intention of Shweta Ketu was not to suffer like what he suffered. When he wanted his mother back, his mother was not there. He knew the pain of living without the mother. Now he thought children should not suffer because of somebody's selfishness. So father and mother should remain together lifelong so that children will not suffer. That was a very noble intention, very great decision of Shweta Ketu. I don't know whether in all other faith systems or in all other cultures all over the world, whether the marriage has been given such a holy importance or such a noble importance. I'm not sure. But nowadays things are also changing. Even in Christianity, before marriage, they conduct some classes for both of them so as to avoid divorce in future. Otherwise, as marriage is also happening, in the same way divorce is also happening nowadays. People think it is their right or it is their freedom. But they don't understand that they will have a lifelong memory of some pain. Or they will have a lifelong memory of some suffering. And if at all the divorce after children are born, how the children are going to grow up with a single parent and what may be the mindset or the psychology of such children when they grow up is again a questionable matter. That is why marriage is a social responsibility. Marriage is not for sensual enjoyment. Now, the people who are married, if at all they have contact with the the third person, let us say husband has a contact with some other woman or the wife has a contact with some other man or we, maybe both of them have contact with some other person and that is adultery. They were supposed to live together. Now, why do they commit adultery? Why people commit adultery? Why don't they remain committed? After all, if they go for a sensual enjoyment or if they go for a physical contact with some other person, what for? Now, if at all they get involved in that, it is only for a temporary physical satisfaction. 
but what is actually going to happen each person when they involve themselves in some such activities which are questionable by the society they do it in a secret way they do it in a hidden manner but the point is whatever i do i remember whatever you do you remember can we raise whatever is there in our memory so easily it is not necessary that adults should be taught about what is right and what is wrong basically adults know what is right and what is wrong because these are well defined in the social system still when people get involved in such activities so called immoral or illegal activities they know it is wrong knowingly they involve themselves in something wrong for some temporary enjoyment what will happen gradually gradually one day or the other the truth will come out in one way or the other the truth will come out in one way or the other your memory will keep on making you remember whatever you are doing again i bring back patanjali statement yoga ha chitta vritti nirodha ha whatever is in the memory if it is not restrained you will keep on recalling whatever you are doing and you know that it is wrong on top of whatever is being done as wrong by you you may have an arrogance over yourself that you may keep defending whatever you are doing in your own way but even if you defend with others about whatever you are doing in your own way internally in your memory you know basically what you are doing so that way gradually what will happen is in future your own memory will be punishing you by developing dilemma within you by developing frustration within you because you have been doing knowingly something wrong now come back to the seventh commandment he directly says or it is directly revealed that why do you do that why even today shri ramachandra is a role model to men and sita devi is a role model to women for the same reason maryada purushottam rama ekapatni vratastha rama pitruvakya paripalaka rama even though rama did not do any such great magical things like krishna has been shown to do lot of magical things still rama is considered so noble why because he was committed to his wife and sita was committed to her husband why even today he is called as sita rama it is a message given by valmiki that in whatever way moses told the seventh commandment in the same way valmiki also has told the same commandment in an indirect way in the ramayana kavya so this is a serious message even for the present generation as well the so called well educated well qualified people also are also involved in adultery not just the uneducated ones in fact uneducated uncivilized people may get involved in prostitution whereas well educated well civilized people are involved in adultery a sin is a sin is a sin in whatever way people may justify themselves about whatever wrong things they are doing they internally know whatever they are doing whether they do it openly or whether they do it secretly also ultimately you remember whatever you do i remember whatever i do and if in my memory i have that guilt or dilemma or if in your memory you have that guilt or dilemma that is going to punish both of us 
that is how the law of karma is going to take its own course let me move on to the eighth commandment thou shalt not steal in which way people have a tendency to steal someone else's belongings in general in the childhood what happens is a small child if it goes to a neighbor's house it may look at a small toy and this child may want to have that small toy and the child may try to steal that toy in its own way either it may demand that it wants that toy or else when someone is not watching it may simply take that toy that is a child's small selfishness where it may want to have that toy for some time but maybe next day or next day the child itself may lose that toy it may not bother much about it that way the child's memory is a temporary memory but why let us say the same child when it grows up it steals money or it steals some other objects why anybody will steal people who cannot earn on their own they will steal people who want to have something without putting effort then also they will steal sometimes whatever they like they immediately want to have it then also they steal in fact stealing is a weakness of the mind where they don't have a steady will power or a strong will power at that moment they become the slaves of their desires so if people are not physically able to earn something they will get into stealing business and if people who look at some object and if they want to have that object for themselves they become the slaves of their instant desires now if they keep getting involved in this how will they ever develop will power how will they ever develop steadiness of mind or how will they ever use the body that is given by god for earning why should people steal why can't people earn on their own after all whatever they steal how long they will survive with whatever they have stolen why don't people involve themselves in honest physical effort for livelihood that is where even today stealing is illegal in any way whatever way you steal that is immoral so if people want to have grace of god they should become fit to receive the grace of god by doing all immoral illegal things if they keep on going to temples or synagogues or churches or holy places and keep on praying to god to have mercy or keep on praying to god to provide abundance if they don't refine themselves then what is the point of all that prayer or all types of spiritual practices actually they are not spiritual practices they are practices to fool themselves so the eighth commandment clearly tells you earn your livelihood by your own capabilities of your physical body as well as the mental fitness coming on to the ninth one thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor which means don't support anybody by giving false witness in fact when there are two neighboring houses as long as they live in harmony they live in cooperation they live in peace both families will have good mental health now maybe for a very silly reason maybe for some stupid reason 
let us say there's an indifference created and let us say both the families keep on increasing this indifference for satisfying their own arrogance now as long as they remain as neighbors they will always have this verbal friction or mental setback they will have a gap in the communication and as long as they have a gap in the communication they will keep on hating each other many times for very silly reasons many times for very stupid reasons now let us say somebody bears a false witness against the neighbor now let us say both these neighbors are living in their own houses then life long there will be enmity between them why not just for neighbor you should not bear false witness against anybody else also but specifically it is told in this ninth commandment thou shalt not bear false witness again thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor also always thou shalt bear true witness for any good relationships but never a false witness otherwise it will be a lifelong pain for both the families coming to the last commandment thou shalt not covet the meaning of covet means craving or excessive desires thou shalt not have craving for something you already know the six enemies kama krodha lobha moha mada matsara covet or craving means moha excessive desire excessive attachment now whenever people have craving now until they obtain whatever is being deeply desired for they will not have a peaceful sleep in fact moha will gradually lead to mada and if whatever is the moha caused and if that desire is not satisfied if that is accomplished by someone else it will lead to matsara the same craving can also lead to arrogance the same dissatisfied craving can also lead to jealousy so these are the 10 commandments which were revealed to the great moses you have to watch the movie the 10 commandments must and should not just once many times maybe 10 times maybe 20 times maybe 100 times still you will have to keep watching this great movie i consider out of all the movies made in the world till now this is a classical educating movie for anybody and everybody on this earth and this is moses you can see the two stones which are in his hands for knowing about those stones watch the movie his time was 1393 till 1273 before the common era he was around 1200 years before christ initially i mentioned veda vyasa later i mentioned zarathustra next i am mentioning moses zarathustra was in some other region veda vyasa was in some other region moses was in some other region still wherever they were they kept on trying to spread the spiritual knowledge also they kept on trying to make people live a quality life also all these commandments are not just for normal life they are the necessity for spiritual life as well 
in what way spirituality and religion are related i told you earlier religion is very much necessary for having a spiritual discipline otherwise how spiritual people will have discipline somebody should groom you into the path of spirituality that is the real purpose of any religion in fact these noble people when they started teaching all these things they did not start a religion on their own but gradually the followers made their own groups and they were called with different names the followers of vedavyasa were called hindus the followers of zarathustra were called farsis and the followers of moses were called yahudis so that way each followers were called by their own names their own groups and later on when there were many number of groups spread all over the world there were many differences among themselves about their own faith systems they have to go back to the roots and they have to understand that the fundamentals are same anywhere everywhere for the human kind let me proceed as for me and my house we will serve the lord joshua in the old testament you will have to watch this movie again the 10 commandments there is a character of joshua there and joshua was one of the ardent followers of moses actually he was the faithful helper to moses as well and this is what joshua says in that movie as for me and my house we will serve the lord now when we work for our livelihood whom are we serving many times people think they are serving a particular boss or a per serving a particular employer or maybe serving a particular organization but whatever joshua says is a sentence of karma yoga whatever is told about karma yoga in sanskrita the same thing is told by joshua what is the definition of karma yoga bhagavad arpana bhava whatever you do you do as if you are offering it to the lord that is what bhagavad gita says whole of the bhagavad gita is basically standing on two pillars one is jnana yoga one is karma yoga and it is the bhakti yoga which is joining them so the basic definition of karma yoga is do whatever you do in life let it be a service to the lord now veda vyasa at this side of the earth joshua at the other side of the earth still joshua told the same thing what veda vyasa told in the bhagavad gita as for me and my house we will serve the lord joshua also says it is not just me it is my house it is my family we will serve the lord he says in plural it simply means that my family is with me in this particular service to the lord if the whole family is united to work together so as to do everything to satisfy god's will automatically everybody else will be satisfied many times in my professional life whenever i have issues i simply think of only one thing that let me work to satisfy god automatically everybody else will be satisfied let us say i don't work to satisfy god there are chances that automatically all other people may also be dissatisfied let me not work to satisfy a particular person the other persons may be dissatisfied 
let us say i want to satisfy my immediate boss my immediate boss may have one more boss he may have one more boss he may have one more boss he or she may have bosses now if i want to satisfy one particular boss the upper level bosses may get dissatisfied let us say i try to satisfy one of the upper level boss the lower level boss or the immediate boss may get dissatisfied now how can i satisfy all of them the way to satisfy all the bosses is to satisfy the ultimate boss the boss of the universe work in such a way as to satisfy god automatically all other human bosses will be satisfied this is a great sentence in fact i read this sentence many decades before in a poster when i saw that poster i saw what a great sentence at that time i had not watched the movie 10 commandments i just saw this sentence and i thought what a great meaning this sentence is having later on when i watched the movie 10 commandments i came to know the context of this sentence when joshua says it there so the sentence of karma yoga in english as told in the bible told by joshua as for me and my house we will serve the lord let us all work in this way only to serve the lord if lord is pleased automatically everyone else will be pleased let us say if the lord is pleased that is enough for us let us not try to please everyone else also even if they are displeased because we cannot satisfy every human being here we can satisfy ourselves if we serve the lord coming to the next faith system as i am going in the chronological order after moses in this part of earth came one great person called mahavira he was earlier named as vardhamana he won over all the instinctual tendencies he conquered the six enemies in fact people physically conquer many other things people can conquer lands people can conquer many other kings and can become emperors people can keep many other people as slaves that is all physical conquering by the physical powers but how to conquer oneself how to conquer one's own ego how to conquer one's own mind how to conquer one's own instincts that is where this vardhamana gradually became a great victorious person mahavira means greatly victorious he had a victory over the six enemies kama krodha lobha moha mada matsara so that is how the word jita means the one who has conquered from the word jita came the word jina from the word jina came the word jaina this jaina is a tadhita word for jina jina was derived from jita so you can see ahimsa paramo dharma was prescribed both by jainism and by buddhism also in fact they were contemporaries mahavira was at the western side of aryavarta and gautama buddha was at the 
northern side of Aryavarta, they had only few decades of difference in their physical existence. But coincidentally, both of them had the same compassionate feeling toward the complete life. So in the Jainism, this is the basic sentence which is spoken, Ahimsa Paramo Dharmaha. Non-violence is the ultimate righteous act. If at all you have to practice righteousness, practice non-violence. But unfortunately, the great idealism of Jainism and Buddhism were completely misused by the invasions by the Ghori Muhammad and Ghazni Muhammad. When people belonging to Jainism and Buddhism practiced Ahimsa Paramo Dharmaha, the invaders who came from the other sides, namely Ghazni Muhammad, came so many times, later on Ghori Muhammad came so many times, they simply turned this sentence into Himsa Paramo Dharmaha. Violence itself is right for us. That way they conquered the upper part of India or looted the upper part of India, I should say. So then even Jains had no other option than to escape. Even the Bauddhas had no other option than to escape. The Bauddhas ran away upwards and the Jainas came down southwards. That was part of the history. But whenever I think about Jainism, I appreciate the true Jains for their food culture, for their practice of non-violence, for their hard-working ability, for their patience. Mahavira Tirthankara had prescribed one special mantra in that particular faith system. This is called Namakara Mantra. In fact, Namaskara in Samskrita became Tadbhava there called Navakara. Namo Arihantanam, Namo Siddhanam, Namo Ayaryanam, Namo Vajjhayanam, Namo Loye Savvasahonam. This is called Navakara Mantra. If I have to tell the same mantra in Samskrita, it can be told in this manner. Namo Arihantanam, Namo Siddhanam, Namo Acharyana, Namo Upadhyayana, Namo Loke Sarvasadhunam. Because that is the exact meaning. Arihanta means the one who has killed the enemy. Ari means enemy, Hanta means killed. Which enemy? The six enemies. Kama, Krodha, Lobha, Moha, Madha, Matsara. These are the six enemies. The one who has killed these six enemies, he is called Arihanta. So all the 24 Tirthankaras in the Jain faith system, they are all Arihanta. Even today, the Digambara system Digambara initiation in the Jain system is a great challenge. They walk naked on road. They sleep on a stone slab. They drink water just by their own hands. They have highest torture for their own physical bodies. And they bear all that. The people who take Digambara Diksha, they leave all the normal comforts which the others are having. 
and they consciously subject themselves to such lifestyle so as to live so natural so as to live without any attachment so as to conquer the six enemies i don't think in any of the other faith systems all over the world the way in which digambara jains are living it may not be there in any other faith system all over the world it's a very tough challenge to walk among the dressed ones as naked and without having any guilt or shame or any such feeling as if it is natural actually it is natural why because that is how the six enemies are killed as long as the bodily attachment is there always that i am the body is going to come into picture now if that i am the body should not come into picture then they take an initiation into the gambara diksha they choose to live as natural as possible shedding away all the normal comforts which we are all enjoying namo arihantanam next namo siddhanam siddha means what the one who has accomplished self realization he is siddha the one who has understood the self he is called buddha from buddha the word buddhi comes from siddha the word siddhi comes siddhi means accomplishment buddhi means intellectual ability so here it is told namo siddhana means the one who has accomplished what the one who has accomplished the conquering of the six enemies arihanta is one stage siddha is another stage namo acharyanam who is acharya achinotit shastrartham acharye acharye sthapayatyapi svayam acharate yasmat tasmat acharya uchyate achinotit shastrartham knowing the meaning of the scriptures holy scriptures acharya sthapayatyapi the one who puts all those into practice in his own life then swayam acharate he himself practices he makes others also to practice he himself also practices whatever he has studied in the holy scriptures such person is called as an acharya so here a spiritual training is required that training is coming from acharya next namo upadhyayana who is an upadhyaya upa plus adhi plus aya adhyaya upadhyaya is a teacher acharya is a preceptor siddha is an accomplisher now only some of them are acharyas all of them cannot be acharyas but there can be teachers upadhyaya means a spiritual teacher acharya means a spiritual preceptor means acharya whatever he says can itself be a shastra but the shastra can be taught by a upadhyaya so salutations to all the spiritual teachers first one is salutations to the one who has conquered the six enemies next one is salutations to all the accomplishers third one is salutations to all the spiritual preceptors fourth one is salutations to all the spiritual teachers last one is salutations to all the holy people on this earth 
नमो लोके सर्व साधु नाम ऑल द साधु रिनशियट्स हु लिव अ नोबल लाइफ हु लिव अ लाइफ ऑफ सेक्रीफाइस फॉर ऑल दो ग्रेट होली पीपल लेट दे आर बी सल्यूटेशन दिस इज कॉल्ड द होली नवकार मंत्र इन फैक्ट इन द वेरी ओल्ड एंड इज संस्कृत यूज टू बी ए नॉर्मल लैंग्वेज ऑफ कम्युनिकेशन ग्रेजुअली संस्कृत ऑल्सो was subjected to many changes in its own pronunciation and many of the offshoots came into picture and many mixtures of sanskrit happened with many other languages also when population got mixed up when people started migrating all over many people came as migrators to this aryavarta or india itself so there was a lot of mixture of the languages but we are fortunate that even today the pure sanskrita also remains and there are many people and many organizations who have dedicated their life even for teaching the pure sanskrita and its relevant literature but there have been offshoots of sanskrita mixtures of sanskrita that is why it is called as tatsama and tadbhava the sanskrita words went into other languages and they became tadbhava it has happened in all dravidian languages also you will find this tadbhava words even in kannada tulu tamil telugu malayalam you will see such words even in hindi so that way it was there even in pali in the ancient india there used to be some local languages in those languages gradually the sanskrit words were subjected to some change that is how arihanta has remained as it is siddha has remained as it is acharya became aarya upadhyaya became uvadhyaya loke became loye sarva became savva sadhu became sahu in fact there are many such words even in buddhism pali was a variant of sanskrit itself or prakrit itself that way even uh, if you read the jaina agamas or the bauddha tripitaka you will find many such words which are actually derived from the original sanskrit words themselves let me proceed now in the jainism there is this particular symbol ahimsa teachings of 24 tirthankaras then there's a hand there that hand is the ahimsa hand then at the base parasparopagraho jeevanam mutual support and interdependence we are all interdependent no one is basically independent all the life forms are interdependent that is what is told in the bhagavata also as jeevo jeevasya jeevanam jeevaha jeevasya jeevanam in one way or the other we are all interdependent nature itself is interdependent so it is better that we live with mutual support parasparaha upagraha jeevanam then there is this tiryancha मनुष्य देव नारकी देर इज अंबल ऑफ स्वस्तिक हियर वेर दिस फोर डॉट्स इंडिकेट तिर्यंच मीन तिर्यक लाइफ फॉर्म्स मीन द लाइफ फॉर्म्स विच आर बिलो ह्यूमन बीइंग्स देन वी हैव दिस मनुष्य ह्यूमन बीइंग्स देन मनुष्य कैन बिकम अ देवा बाय डेवलपिंग अरिहंता क्वालिटीज at the same time manushya can also become a naraki means naraka means hell manushya can also become an adhama manushya can become worse than an animal also see this tiryak means all types of other birds and animals and other creatures which are below humans but human being can become worse than those animals also by doing all types of sinful deeds 
without trying to conquer the six enemies by yielding himself to the six enemies manushya can also become naraki that is what is indicated by the swastika symbol here and with the dots here now actually what this swastika symbol means see there is a base line there is a vertical line then there is a upper base line horizontal line again there is a vertical line there is a horizontal line there is a vertical line means from the lower level gradually elevate yourself up and remain at the top uddhret atmana atmanam na atmanam avasadayet but when you elevate yourself to the upper level remain in balance with the life see when you elevate yourself up you will have to maintain the balance that balance is basically karma yoga parasparah upagraha jeevanam so that is aptly indicated by the symbol of swastika you elevate yourself up when you elevate yourself up remain balanced in life that is the meaning of swastika now at the top you will see the three dots right faith right knowledge right conduct and at the top you can see a symbol that symbol indicates the siddhas who have accomplished devatva and who have accomplished arihanta who have accomplished through right faith right knowledge and right conduct just theory is not enough the theory should become practice now if theory should be digested there should be the faith with the acharya there should be the faith with the upadhyaya there should be the faith with the sadhu there should be the faith with the siddha there should be the faith with the arihanta so this is the symbol a holy symbol used in jainism the time of mahavira tirthankara was 599 till 527 before the common era or before christ in fact before christ we measure the number of years in the decreasing order after christ we start counting in the increasing order so after moses now it is mahavira tirthankara or jainism let me proceed the next one are almost the same contemporary of mahavira tirthankara was siddhartha later who was called as gautama buddha almost whatever was told by mahavira tirthankara the same things were told by gautama buddha as well you already know why he was called as gautama buddha because one day one lady called gautami came to him she was very much upset that there was a death in the family and she came to buddha asking for some solution for this sorrow or this agony and buddha told her go to any home bring me some mustard seeds from a house where there was no death now this lady really thought that uh, let me do it let me go to many houses i may get a mustard seed from somewhere where there is no death which happened in that house and if i bring it back buddha will somehow give me solution to come out of this agony but she went she went and visited so many houses everywhere she asked give me some mustard seed but you should not have had any death in this house but gautami could not get it at all finally when gautami came back to buddha she told i could not get a mustard seed also from any house because all the houses had deaths always then buddha told that itself is the solution the death is not your personal agony just because in your house you had 
someone die, you need not take it as a personal agony or personal pain. Death is common to everyone. In fact, death is the truth of life. The same thing is told even in the yogic and Vedic scriptures. It is told even in the Bhagavad Gita that whatever is born is bound to die. In fact, death becomes certain as soon as you are born. Only the date and time are not yet fully decided. If you keep on practicing yoga bhyasa, if you remain healthy, you may live a little longer. Otherwise, you may live a little shorter. Otherwise, death is a certainty of life. Gautami understood that with the hard fact. Now this was understood by this Buddha long back. Otherwise, how can a prince leave his palace? Which prince has left a palace? Except Siddhartha. Almost all princes will remain arrogant and they want to become king as early as possible, right? Now this particular prince left his palace at the night time. When everybody else was sleeping, he was awake. And he found out the four noble truths which I had already discussed earlier. So because of this Gautami, he was later on called as Gautama Buddha. Look at his posture. Look at his face. What a calm face. Half closed eyes. It simply indicates he was in Samadhi because the face can have such appearance only in Samadhi where eyes need not be fully closed, eyes need not be fully open. He is not actually looking outside, he is not actually looking inside, he is not looking anything. He is not dreaming, he is not awakened, he is not sleeping. Najagaro napi sushipti bhavo najivitam no maranam vichitram. Buddha had the experience of samadhi. And when he came out of the experience of samadhi, he had the intuitive insight within him. And he told the truth in his own ways. People may say his four truths are sadistic or negative, but that is the people's judgment. Now when he says to Gautami that there is no house where there is no death, if he would have told it initially to her, she would have objected. She would have told to Buddha that you don't understand my pain, my agony, you are a monk. Actually many people had insulted Buddha in the same way, right? They had told that he is a useless monk, he is a beggar. They had tortured him that way. You already know the story of Angulimala, right? If you don't know the story of Angulimala, read it. There was a dacoit, a robber. He used to kill people, he used to rob them and then he used to kill them. And he used to make a garland of all the fingers of those people whom he had killed. Anguli means finger. Mala means garland. He used to make a garland of those fingers and he used to wear them. He was a very cruel robber called Angulimala. But Angulimala changed because of the company of Buddha. So initially, all the people had insulted Buddha in many other ways. That way, all the spiritual masters have been insulted and tortured and troubled by the common people only. Now, if Buddha would have told this truth to Gautami before, she would not agree. Buddha made her to understand the truth in her own way. Truth is a truth is a truth. Whether you agree or whether me agree or whoever agrees or disagrees. Truth remains truth. That death is the certainty of life. 
But how do we live until death? That is up to us. The time of Buddha was 563 to 483 before Christ. You can see there were only few decades of difference between Mahavira Tirthankara and Gautama Buddha. Now for those four truths which Buddha told earlier, I had mentioned that there is a noble eightfold path where it is possible to eradicate suffering when we are living. That is called Arya Ashtanga Marga. Just like in the Patanjali system it is called Ashtanga Yoga, here it is called Ashtanga Marga. Arya means who? Any person who is courageous as well as spiritual, such person is called Arya. So, the eight paths which are noble are First one is right view, samyak drishti, right intention, samyak sankalpa, right speech, samyak vachana, right action, samyak karma, right livelihood, samyak jivika, right effort, samyak vyayama, right mindful, samyak sati, right concentration, samyak samadhi. Now the first two, samyak drishti, samyak sankalpa is part of wisdom or prajna and samyak vachana, samyak karma, samyak jivika is part of virtue or ethical conduct or shila and samyak vyayama, samyak sati, samyak samadhi is part of concentration or mental discipline or samadhi. Prajna, shila, samadhi. As I have told, these are again Sanskrit words who have slightly been altered and it is called as Pragya, it is called Shila. So this is the noble eightfold path by means of which suffering can be ended while living itself. Provided you practice right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. Now for all these right things, one should be trained. After training, one should practice. Only then, suffering can be ended. Life can be worthy living if these eight things are practiced. Otherwise, there is suffering to oneself. The same person who is under suffering will also cause suffering to others because of ignorance. Again, this is called as the wheel. The same wheel was later utilized by Ashoka as a symbol of Buddha's teachings. Right view, know the truth. Right intentions, free your mind of evil. Right speech, say nothing that hurts others. In Samskrita, we have a Subhashita, Satyam Bruyat, Priyam Bruyat, Na Bruyat, Satyam Apriyam, Priyancha, Na Anratam Bruyat, Eshaha Dharmaha Sanatanaha. Truth should be told. Truth that is pleasant has to be told. Satyam Bruyat, Priyam Bruyat. Na bruyat satyam apriyam. Unpleasant truth should not be told. Priyancha na anratam bruyat. Even if it is pleasant, lie should not be told. Eshaha dharmaha sanatanaha. This is the ancient righteousness. So Buddha says, right speech, say nothing that hurts others. Right action, work for the good of others. What did Joshua say? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So work for the good of others. Right livelihood, respect life. What Moses told? Thou shalt not steal. Right livelihood. Right effort, resist evil. 
right concentration practice meditation right mindfulness control your thoughts so these were the ashtanga marga taught by gautama buddha as i am going in the chronological order now i am coming to the person whom i had been mentioning many times before as the greatest scientist on this earth this is maharshi patanjali he came after gautama buddha he came after mahavira tirthankara naturally patanjali also included the teachings of mahavira tirthankara and gautama buddha in his principles of ashtanga yoga now yama niyama asana pranayama pratyahara dharana dhyana samadhi these were called as ashtanga yoga by patanjali but in that in the beginning he said yama next he said niyama yama is external ethics ahimsa satya asteya brahmacharya aparigraha non harming benevolent truthfulness responsibility non stealing unity and simplicity and generosity ahimsa mahavira tirthankara told ahimsa paramo dharma that was added here by patanjali satya being truthful that was added here asteya non stealing that was added here brahmacharya having a control over the physical instincts that is one dimension to it one more dimension is yaha brahmani charati saha brahmachari the one who is moving with the brahman that means even in the mind brahman should be there brahman is omnipresent that knowledge should be there that feeling should be there that is called brahmacharya let me tell you a small story Vishwamitra had become a brahmarshi and after he became a brahmarshi Vishwamitra had his own hermitage which was very near to Vasishta's hermitage and after he became brahmarshi all his enmity had lo- had been lost he asked for forgiveness from Vasishta and Vasishta told him you can stay nearby somewhere to my hermitage only so that you can be in contact later on also that was the greatness of vasishta now vishwamitra had his hermitage very near to the uh, hermitage of vasishta in between those two hermitages there was a small stream of water flowing and vasishta's uh, wife's name was arundhati every day vasishta's wife arundhati used to uh, prepare food and pack lunch for vishwamitra she used to personally take it there cross the stream and go to vishwamitra's hermitage and offer him the food and she used to come back now one day she packed the lunch for vishwamitra when when she was going the stream was overflowing the previous day heavy rain had come and the stream was overflowing so arundhati came back when arundhati came back vasishta asked what happened now arundhati told because the stream is now overflowing i cannot cross over i don't know how to uh, offer this lunch to vishwamitra he will remain hungry there now vasishta told go back to the stream there and tell the stream or tell yourself that if i am nitya brahmachari then let the stream subside for some time arundhati told how you are nitya brahmachari you are married to me we have a son called shakti we had a son maybe in my later sessions i will tell the story of shakti not today 
So Arundhati told, we had a son called Shakti and how is it that you are married to me? How can you be Brahmachari? How can you be celibate? Brahmachari basically means celibate, the one who is not married. Now Vasishta told, don't simply talk of so many things. Don't simply think of too many things. Just do what I say. Go there and tell to the stream that if my husband is Nitya Brahmachari, let me get the path to cross over. Arundhati went there. She simply told there, if my husband Vasishtha is Nitya Brahmachari, let me cross over the stream. Immediately, the stream of water subsided and she could cross over. She was wondering what is this happening and she went all the way. She gave the lunch to Vishwamitra and she wanted to come back to her hermitage. Vishwamitra thanked her and he told you can go back to Vasishtha's hermitage. When she was coming back, again the stream was overflowing because it was subsided only at that particular instant when she told the previous sentence of Nitya Brahmachari. Now when she was coming, stream was again overflowing. Then she went back to Vishwamitra's hermitage now. She told to Vishwamitra, while coming I had a problem and my husband gave me a solution. Now I have to go back, again there is a problem, stream is still overflowing, I cannot cross over. Vishwamitra had finished the lunch by that time. Now Vishwamitra told to uh, Arundhati, go back and tell to the stream that if Vishwamitra is Nityopavasi, let there be a path to cross over. Arundhati is again wondering, what are you saying? How can you be Nityopavasi? Now only you have eaten full lunch. Upavasa means starving. Nitya Upavasi means always starving. On the other side, my husband was telling that he is a Nitya Brahmachari. He is a daily celibate. Even though he is married to me and we had a son. Still he says he is a Nitya Brahmachari daily celibate. And the stream subsided. Now again you have eaten lunch in front of me. Daily you are eating lunch. I am only bringing lunch to you. How can you say that you are Nitya Upavasi? How can you say that you are daily starving? Vishwamitra again laughed and told, I am telling you whatever again your husband is, has told you, simply go and tell that. Don't think of too many things. Don't worry about so many things. Simply go and tell, the stream will subside. So she went there. Near the stream, she stood and again it, she told, if Vishwamitra is Nitya Upavasi, let me find a path to go back. And immediately the stream subsided. She could cross over. And she came back to the hermitage and she asked her husband, what is this happening? You are telling that you are Nitya Brahmachari and he is telling that he is Nitya Upavasi and stream is giving a path to go that side and this side. How is it possible? Then Vasishta told, my dear wife, Nitya Brahmachari actually means what? Daily, I am moving in the Brahman. I am part of the Brahman. So, Brahmacharya means what? Brahman is omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent. My mind is always moving with the Brahman. My mind is always thinking of the Brahman. Daily, always. That is the meaning of Nitya Brahmachari. Arundhati touched her husband's feet and asked for forgiveness that she did not understand the terminology. Again, she came up and she asked, now my question is, how can Vishwamitra be Nitya Upavasi? How can he be daily starving? I am only giving him food daily. Now Vasishta again laughed and told, my dear wife, Upavasa means what? Upavasa means staying near. Staying near whom? He is also staying near Brahman daily. 
Vishwamitra also is staying near God only daily. He is also doing the same spiritual penance which I am involved in. We both are Brahmarshis. So, I am with the Brahman always and he is also very near to the Brahman only always. Upavasa means staying adjacent. Brahmacharya means moving with the God. So, we both are that way only. That is how the stream was giving a path to you to cross over. My dear friends, understand the meaning of Brahmacharya. What Patanjali has put. Remaining unmarried is not Brahmacharya. Many people think that way. That is wrong. For that matter, even Krishna is a Brahmachari only. Even though Krishna has eight wives, he is a Brahmachari only. Because Krishna himself is the moving Brahman. The eight chakras in the body are his wives. Brahmacharya has to be understood in that spiritual angle, not just with the physical angle. Now the last one in the five yamas is Aparigraha, simplicity, generosity. So these were the five yama prescribed by Patanjali. Next, the five niyama or the internal ethics prescribed by Patanjali. Shaucha, Santosha, Tapas, Swadhyaya, Ishwara Pranidhana. Shaucha, Clarity, Purity. Santosha, Contentment. Tapas, Discipline, Sacrifice for Others. Swadhyaya, Self-Study. Ishwara Pranidhana, Surrender, Service to Something Bigger. Without practicing Yama and Niyama, if you practice Pranayama, Pratyahara, Dharana, Dhyana, how can you think of achieving Samadhi? Samadhi is not everyone's accomplishment. If the goal is to have self-realization, in the beginning there must be external ethics and internal ethics. There must be Yama and Niyama in the beginning only. Only then if you practice asana, if you practice pranayama, if you practice pratyahara, if you practice dharana, if you practice dhyana, then we can say you are in the path of yoga. But all over the world, funny thing which I am seeing is, how many yoga schools are teaching yama and niyama? How many yoga teachers are involved in yama and niyama? And what are they teaching? If they keep claiming that they are teaching yoga, are they teaching yoga when they themselves are in roga or in bhoga? That is a big question, but I cannot ask this question with the bigger sound. Because when majority is foolish, only minority are wise, who should talk against whom itself is a big question. Let me not get into that domain. That is not my intention as well. Anyhow, I am speaking only to a small set of people, right? Uh, there are only 15 people right now listening to me. That's all. So let us limit ourselves to this much of talk only. So this was Maharshi Patanjali's contribution to the humankind. The time of Maharshi Patanjali was around 400 years before Christ or before the common era. Next comes Jesus Christ. Now, this sentence also I had told earlier. This is found in the New Testament of the Bible in the chapter Matthew. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. For whoever asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, the door is opened. In fact, in the spiritual domain, there is nothing called secret. Everything is open. In nature, there is nothing called secret. Nature is naked. 
Naked in the sense, nature is open. Open. Nature has not kept anything as secret. In nature, everything is open. But the problem with the human beings is, they are looking at nature with the impure eyes or the covered eyes. They should uncover their own eyes so as to look at nature as it is. God has never kept anything secret. God has made everything completely open. People are not having the eyes to see God as he is. God is life. People are not having the eyes to see life as God. That is where in the Bible Jesus says, Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. You should know what to ask. You should know what to seek. Knock and it shall be opened to you. You should know where to knock. For whoever asks, he receives. And he who seeks, finds. I am the living example for this. When I was in the second year BE, I was alone in the room almost for one year. Before that I had uh, roommates, after that I had roommates. For that particular one year I was alone in the room. Every night I used to sleep around 10, 30, 11 o'clock and even when I was in the awakened state, I used to ask simply questions to myself. Strangely, by morning, answers used to come to me from within, suddenly somehow. For whatever questions I used to ask for myself, answer used to come to me in the early morning. That is when I started communicating to myself directly using words only. Later on I understood that I was actually communicating to God only that way. Self is God only. So in the deep sleeping state, it is the self which is completely conscious. So in the mornings, I used to get all the answers. Even now, I have this practice. If at all I have any deeper problem, deeper question, which I cannot get so easily the answer when I am in the awakened state. Before I go to sleep, I take that question with me, with the humility, with the faith. And in the morning when I wake up, suddenly I will have the answer. Suddenly I will have the solution. So my dear friends, I am the living example for this. For whoever asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. Again I am the living example for this. I have been seeking the answers for so many such questions. I have been seeking the solutions for health issues, whether physical issues or mental issues. And I have been seeking the solutions for many other imbalances that people are suffering. And gradually, in one way or the other, I had a contact with Kashi Matha in Malvishram, where I learned Samskrita, where I learned Bhagavad Gita systematically from a competent teacher, Srimati Veena Nagaraja. And I had a contact with Adhyatma Prakasha Karyalaya, Holinarsipura, where all the authentic books written by Adi Shankaracharya were all translated into Kannada by Shri Sachidanendra Saraswati Swamiji. I had a contact with Arya Samaja where they publish a magazine called Veda Taranga and they have printed 20 volumes of Veda Bhashya in Kannada. In this way, 
I had a contact with Maharshi Vedadri. Along with that, my great fortune is that I learned the Ashtanga Yoga from my Guruji, Sri A.S. Narsimhamurthy, who learnt it from Dr. Swami Gitananda Giri, the holy lineage all the way to Bhrugu. Now, I did not put any serious efforts for all these connections, but I was simply seeking and somehow I found it. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, the door is opened. When I knock the door of the Lord, always he says, the door is open. Even now, whenever I am alone, I communicate to him only. Many times from my home, when I go to the college, all the way on my bike when I am driving, I am talking to him only. Many times when I come back also, I am talking to him only. Because he is accessible always. So it is a great sentence which Jesus Christ has told in the Bible. And it is true to its word. The only thing is, you people have to practice these sentences now. You people know, should know what to ask. You people should know what to seek. And you people should know where to knock. Ask within. Seek within. Knock within. And all the meaning of the sentence will be clear to you. With this particular slide, let me stop the session today. Let me see you day after tomorrow because tomorrow is Thursday. Day after tomorrow on Friday, let us meet once again. Take care and goodbye. Let me see who are all there in this session now, just for my own curiosity. Okay, some are my own yoga students, some are my old college students, some are my present college students and only a few are strangers. I cannot say strangers, newly known people. Fine, at least I am happy that 15 people are listening to me. Let me end the session for today. See you on Friday.